<laughs> this is my happy place. This is yeah. real. Really? I have yeah. to come here every it day. It is a beautiful <laughs> lot. John Quincy Adams' son, Charles Francis Adams, did build a home up on President's Lane. And if any of you are from Quincy and do fondly refer to the old house as the old house, can I see a show of hands? <laughs> it became the old house when Charles Francis Adams bought or purchased or built the new house. And that's what it was referred to, and that was in 1836. So John Quincy Adams had inherited his father's property upon his father's death in 1826. And uh, unfortunately, John Quincy Adams never really got to spend a lot of time here in Quincy. Most of his life was spent abroad or in Washington, D.C. on his dip diplomatic or political appointments. But he did always treasure this property as well as his birthplace home as a place of refuge and solace. And believe me, if we think politics is bad now, it was just as ugly back then. And um, many of you might have even heard the references to the John Quincy Adams and the Andrew Jackson, um, you know, horrible uh, election. So many, many times this was a place of solace. But we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the trees and the John Quincy Adams legacy. And that really is what we have here in Quincy for John Quincy Adams' legacy. Is he had a fascination with natural history and botany. And he studied trees. He would plant them in his crystal in China and watch them grow. He loved to plant acorns and fruit stones, etc. So he uh, planted many fruit trees <laughs> on his property as well as in Washington, D.C. There was a whole row of elm trees lining the front of the old house uh, during his lifetime, and unfortunately they were lost to the elm plight. During John Quincy Adams' time, he carried over the tr tradition that his parents had started, and that was taking in any of the family members that needed a home, needed a place to live. So during John and Abigail's time, there were 16 people living in the old house. Nieces would come to live there if they were unmarried or widowed, etc. Um, grandchildren came to live there, etc., etc. So the house was an always busy, bustling place. John's youngest son, Thomas Boylston Adams, and his family lived during the house through most of his adult life. And on a side note, John Quincy Adams and his wife, Louisa Catherine, did not get along very well with a <laughs> little sibling rivalry there. But um, it was upon um, this busy, hectic life that John Quincy Adams would use this place as solace. And unfortunately, his son, his youngest son, Charles Francis Adams, always had the financial obligation and burden to uphold this property while his father was abroad or in Washington. So Charles Francis always did have a bit of a resentment towards this property, but it, he ended up calling it home and coming to love it very much. John Quincy Adams knew this property as a decrepit working farm. Charles Francis Adams ended up transforming it from a farm into a gentleman's country estate, and that's what we see today. And the houses we're going to look at, the information that I'm going to be um, discussing briefly, is from the 1986 architectural survey that was done by the city of Quincy. Just a brief primer on um, colonial revival. It, it's a whole series of styles that rolled into one another. 1932, the Quincy Savings Bank, during the Depression, foreclosed on the house. They took ownership and they converted the house into eight well, eight o'clock. To come up in the driveway, so uh, I'm going to read this spiel, and, and then we can look at some things. And I, and again, I say we should we, we, we should at least walk around the corner and look at it from that angle. You get a better idea of the house. Um, the impressively cited Adams Angier Powell property is one of the largest on President's Hill. It was built by the Honorable Charles Francis Adams in 1836 and dubbed the new house by the Adams family. And that's when Peaceville became the old house. 
The architect for the house was Thomas Eyre, A-Y-R-E, and the builder was William Sparrow, S-P-A-R-R-E-L-L. Adams remained here until 1849 when he moved to the present Vassal Adams House, a.k.a. Peacefield, uh, the old house, upon his father's death. John Quincy Adams loved to plant trees, and he said in 1835 in his diary, I cannot bring myself to take much interest in flowers because they pass off and perish, leaving nothing behind. But the trees, which yet 100 years hence will bear delicious fruit or afford a shelter and shade of after ages of men, these yield me delight. Now, the people who were selling this house, um, when I looked at this real estate information back in around 2000, um, they said that um, one of the 12 beech trees planted by John Adams was probably John Quincy Adams is still here. Quincy. Um, yeah, so the master bedroom is upstairs to the left there. So it's, I guess, towards the south. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the property was acquired by Albert H. Crafts, a wholesale shoe dealer in Boston. The new owner in 1927 was Ralph Terrell, another Boston leather dealer. Dealer. The Terrells remained in residence until 1940, and I believe it's the Terrell for which the Elks Lodge up on Quarry Hill is named, same family. The land on which 121 President's Lane is located belonged to the estate of Charles Francis Adams and passed into the hands of President's Hill Annex Real Estate. I think, I think most of you realize that the Adams family became developers of sorts. The Adams building downtown was their last major project, which is across from the cemetery and, and city hall. Built, probably built in 1915 by a Morton T. Swallow, Swallow, S-W-A-L-L-O-W, occupation unknown, who remained there until after 1930. The land formerly belonged to Charles Francis Adams' estate and was divided in, in 1876. Were it not for the plethora, I always find it interesting under the architectural significance when they start, were it not. Were it not for the plethora of classical details and typical columnar impedimented portico, <laughs> colonial revival, house could have been labeled prairie style. Anybody familiar with prairie style? Yeah. And, and, and what they say is, with its strong, bold, horizontal massing, wide overhang, low pitch hip roof. However, the symmetry of the facade, the presence of a balustrade on the roof, the full length front porch, the single windows, the Palladian window at the head of the stairs in the rear elevation, uh, which we'll see possibly as we turn the corner. The house at 159 Monroe Road was probably built by J.W. McInerney, an attorney and counselor at law who had offices both in Boston and Quincy. By 1907, the new owner was H. Everett Crane, partner of F.H. Crane & Sons, local dealers in hay, grain, and flour. Another partner in the firm, Frank Clay Crane, lived around the corner at 11 Avon Way. The house on Monroe Road, formerly called Wally Street, and that's W-H-A-L-L-E-Y, is built on land that belonged to the Honorable Charles Francis Adams. The shingle style was followed, which followed the Queen Anne style, was favored for seaside and suburban homes. The trend began with grandiose shingle summer homes of McKim, Mead, and White.